Paul is. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we 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 can continue to record. Uh, we will be back next week, by the way, for the 106th grassroots call call, uh, call again at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Same uh, a link. Uh, we still have 67 people on the call. Paul Gunter, can you tell us now what are uh, it, what are the nuclear provisions? We've been through the health provisions. We've been through the solar provisions um, in this IRA bill. And Alex, will get to you as part of this in a minute. Alex Williams, Paul Gunter, you are one of the most distinguished experts on nuclear power in the world. What is uh, What are the nuclear aspects of this bill that has just passed? <laughs> Thanks, Harvey. Um, well, you know, I, I have to say we're still sorting that out. Uh, generally speaking, um, there's um, if you look at the formula that uh, is being used here, there's about uh, fifty-three billion dollars in the Inflation Reduction Act for the bailout of existing uneconomical reactors in the United States. So. I haven't seen, it doesn't mean it's not in there, but I have not seen any money for um, new reactors, uh, but uh, it's just because we haven't found it. There was money, for example, in the Build Back Better Act uh, that has been subsumed by the um, uh, IRA, but, um, that did contain uh, money for new fuel production facilities, nuclear fuel production facilities in the United States for this um, high assay, uh, low enriched uranium that would be uh, required to fuel uh, new advanced reactors. And this is, uh, you know, for a typical reactor like um, Diablo Canyon, um, the fuel enrichment uh, is about three to 5% uranium-235. Uh, this high assay enriched, low enriched uranium or HALU as it's called is just under 20% uh, enriched uh, U-235. So it's, um, it's approaching, you know, um, it's on that it's on that spectrum of weapons grade, um, and um, it in fact is going into reactors like uh, Bill Gates's um, TerraPower reactor um, that is uh, in fact a dual purpose small modular reactor. Dual purpose meaning that it can be used to make plutonium for nuclear weapons and uh, the excess heat from that production process uh, can make electricity. Now, Gates and this uh, TerraPower reactor wants to export these reactors to countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, which has come under the scrutiny of some of the uh, most uh, distinguished um, non-proliferation groups in the United States and around the world as being a grave concern that commercial power reactors will become um, export items for uh, nuclear weapons proliferation in uh, un unstable zones like the Middle East. But um, right now, Halu fuel is only commercially available through Russia. So um, the, the situation is now that we've got a hot war in Ukraine um, that um, you know, has raised the question about uh, uh, sanctions against Russia. Um, the whole idea of um, our advanced reactors being dependent on uh, solely dependent on uh, Russian uh, Halu fuel has raised this question that, well, maybe we should be making it ourselves. So we highly suspect that the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, does have um, uh, this uh, 
you know, money to jumpstart okay. the production of um, the uh, uh, this advanced fuel. Okay. But, uh, generally, it's for keeping uneconomical reactors operating. So Ron Leonard has put in the chat that the bill has thirty billion dollars in tax credits over the next ten years to keep atomic reactors operating, even though the atomic reactors cannot compete with solar or wind for that matter. And you pointed out to me a very important point that no one has been talking about, which is that um, when the nuclear power, and this is critical, but we, it requires a small history. When the nuclear power industry was first getting going, nobody would invest in it because of the dangers of a major disaster. So the, the, the Congress stepped in and with the, with the so-called Price-Anderson Act, P-R-I-C-E-Anderson. And in the Price-Anderson Act, the liability for nuclear power plants in case of a major disaster was set at $540 million, which is less than a drop in the bucket compared to the, da the, da the, uh, the damage that could be done by an atomic power plant. Now, all these years later, and the, what the Congress said was, and Paul, we, you, know, you and I discussed this, is that, well, as nuclear power improves, the private insurance industry will step up and take on liability for a nuclear power disaster. And so the first Price-Anderson Act went for 15 years. And it was, and, and they said after 15 years, we won't need it anymore. Small problem, no insurance company anywhere in the world will insure a nuclear power disaster. So now all these years later, we're going into 2025. And in 2025, the Price-Anderson Act will again expire. And so the, what the Price-Anderson Act has said is the public is responsible. There is a small tax on nuclear power that has resulted in a federal fund of $12 billion or thereabouts to cover the disaster of a nuclear power explosion like Chernobyl or Fukushima. Chernobyl, the, the the damage was well in excess of a trillion dollars, probably way more. Fukushima, we can't even begin to calculate. So the reality is we have 92 reactors in this country going into 2025 that do not have any form of private insurance. And it will be now be up to the Congress, in addition to all this money in the IRA bill, to it will be up to the Congress to decide whether we're going to continue to have the federal government ensure these horrific reactors. Is that accurate, Paul? Is there anything you want to add to that? Well, the uh, Price-Anderson Act was last renewed in 20, uh, 05, 2005. So uh, it does, it, these are 20 year uh, re, uh, renewal cycles. So in December, 2025, Congress will be due to vote. Um, so, you know, essentially we're starting a campaign right now to educate that um, these so-called inherently safe small modular reactors are going to be asking for Price-Anderson coverage because, in fact, they're not, they don't have confidence in this claim that at least not enough confidence that they're willing to put their own money on the table uh, to, uh, and, and nor are the insurance companies. So um, that is a big concern because this is part, it's a major part of the misinformation um, that uh, continues to circulate about uh, both the reliability, the, the ultimate cost of construction, how long it's going to take to build these things, uh, all the, the facts that have been misrepresented um, and you know each generation of new reactors has been chasing um, that aren't true. 
And uh, the fact that uh, they're completely unreliable uh, in terms of, you know, these are, these are uh, you know, they're called advanced reactor designs, but these are, these are reactors uh, like the liquid uh, metal uh, sodium cooled reactors um, that are the, um, uh, again, these Terra power reactors. These are 1940s designs. <laughs> Well, and, 1940 was such a, a vintage year. A vintage and they year may have, year. they may have, uh, they may have some new bells and whistles, but essentially they were, uh, you know, they were built for making nuclear weapons, and that the uh, the byproduct heat was too cheap to meter because they were building weapons. That's where too cheap to meter came. Because right. it was, you know, the principal, the principal product was nuclear weapons material. Now, right. of course, so that's, you know, that's not changed. We're seeing now, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later that we're, go we're cycling back into um, a proliferation issue. And even, even the current generation of reactors that we've got right now, like Tennessee Valley authorities, uh, Watts bar units um, in uh, Tennessee. They are providing nuclear weapons uh, materials that principally the tritium, the radioactive hydrogen that's in the H bomb. So we've got commercial power reactors right now that uh, are working for the Department of Defense uh, as well as TVA and electric rate right. payers to make hydrogen bombs. Right, and anybody that ever doubted the terrorism dimension of the nuclear power industry has to just look at what this insane situation, absolutely terrifying in Ukraine, where the Russians have set up <clears throat> artillery batteries right next to nuclear power plants. I mean- well, Today, you know, Harvey, NBC is reporting uh, just a few hours ago that that um, there there have been satellite photos of that are confirming that Russian troops are moving explosives around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. In fact, confirming that that uh, Russian forces are mining the nuclear power station that they're occupying. So not only are they operating uh, artillery uh, positioned on a nuclear power site and firing live rounds in, a, in their barrage into Ukraine, um, but they've also uh, set the nuclear power station up for sabotage by themselves. And uh, one of the generals there was quoted as saying to the so you know the Ukrainian liberators he called them it's either a Russian desert or a radioactive desert as if that's the options that are now left for Ukraine. So unbelievable, this, unbelievable. This is um, you know this is really just another example of the uh, not only the madness of this conflict as if any conflict is can be rational but the fact that this is in a uh, a country that is a nuclear power at least operating nuclear power plants um, with a nuclear weapon um, armed occupying force um, and and the odds are just going up right now the UN secretary general was on the news today as well, saying that the situation is becoming uh, ever more critical, um, and um, it's really uh, it's really disturbing. You're you're muted. You're Harvey. muted, Harvey. You're muted, Harvey. Uh, Alex Williams is next. Steve, I'd like to prolong the taping ten more minutes. This is just. Uh, God almighty, uh, Alex Williams, go ahead, please. And then we'll have Myla and Ron and Tatanka and Jed. Go ahead, Alex. You gotta ask them to mute you. Unmute. Yeah. 
And I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, how do you uninvent nuclear? Hmm. Well, that's <laughs> you get Tinkerbell to come in and wave her magic wand. No, no, it's you know, it's the it's the question, it's an age-old question that goes back to alchemy. How do you change lead into gold? And that, that's the dilemma. It's really not, it's really not possible. No, we're the in a conundrum. Is, how, how do you make this human race sane enough? There is one instance in history in Japan, um, in the samurai culture, uh, the Westerners introduced uh, a weapon, guns. And actually, the, the, after a period of time, Japan banned guns entirely and got rid of guns. They didn't want it. That's the only instance I can think of that's in any way parallel. We still have 60 people on after two hours. Uh, Milo Reeson, go ahead. And Paul, thank you. You're so incredibly articulate. Uh, very much appreciate Steve, I apologize, but I do want to go another 10 minutes with this. We have five, six people with hands. Go ahead, Myla. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I've got a question. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're faced with this funding for these advanced reactors, but we, I'm constantly hearing an argument that's put forth by people who represent the nuclear power industry, who make the claim, a claim about base load. And they say that uh, renewables simply cannot provide the base load energy needed that nuclear can. And I'm wondering if you can just decipher for us and provide an easy explainer to um, to counter that base load argument. Go ahead, Paul. Well, you know, base load is a hundred year old uh, concept. Okay, and uh, in fact, right now um, there are enough renewables um, and enough battery storage capability that we can be building microgrids, which are more stable. I mean, baseload grids are responsible for regional blackouts too, um, that are caused by you know squirrels crawling down uh, utility lines uh, or trees falling across a, a transmission line. But um, the technology uh, is rapidly growing right now, uh, particularly for utility grade battery storage and other storage. Uh, cap energy storage capabilities um, that are, uh, you know, according to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, nearly 90% of the new generating capacity um, in the United States for the first quarter coming online was from renewable energy. And um, so, uh, we're now putting, you know, renewable energy is the market driven. Um, it's no longer alternative energy. It is the conventional energy source of choice now. Um, so we've got to upgrade this patchwork grid system uh, that is um, old, it's brittle, and it's time to move to smart grids that are um, compartmentalized, which means that they're safer, um, they're, um, and uh, that, you know, you don't, you can re begin to reduce the uh, risks of, of uh, okay. wide-scale grid uh, problems. So what exactly is base load? Is that, uh, Viola asks, is that, that means that you have a, a, well, can you tell us real quickly, Paul, and then we're going to go to Ron Leonard. Well, base load is essentially that you have 24 seven, um, you know, you've got, uh, you know, nuclear power stations running and they have spinning reserve behind them. Uh, so that if one of these large capacity units goes down, there uh, would be spinning reserve to come online. But, um, you know, we can, uh, again, we can become, um, smarter, um, we can use um, uh, more, uh, you know, electricity more efficiently, uh, we can, and provide it with reliability um, is, as, or, you know, utility grade uh, storage systems are 
hooked in. Okay, um, uh, uh, Ron Leonard, please. Ron Leonard. I'll ask you to unmute, there you uh, go. So, uh, you know, great question. How do you, how do you provide power with 100% renewable energy? Answer is real easy and we have the science to prove it. I put in the, uh, the chat, a webinar that's gonna occur on the 16th. You should all attend it. It was done by Richard Perez and his son, Mark Perez. Mark actually did his doctoral thesis on 100% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. The science is there not to worry. Uh, on the issue of how we spend our money in this uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, well, we are spending uh, three cents per kilowatt hour subsidizing nuclear power, which is a bad investment. Take that same money, that same exact dollar figure, and move it over to renewable energy, you've just solved your problem with oh, baseload power. Baseload power is a myth. It's a simple calculation of how much energy you need to produce based on historical references. And it's much better to produce energy in the load pocket than to ship it from a power station way out in the hinterlands back into the last mile. And FERC actually did a calculation on that shipping of power. Only 20% of the energy is delivered to the last mile from all that coal, fossil fuel, or nuclear energy that you produce way out in the hinterlands. So there's a solution for it. It's cost effective, it's easy, and it's smart to do. Uh, Je Thank you, Don. Uh, Jeff Young, uh, and then uh, Tatanka. And then we're gonna, we're gonna get, our, everybody got your hand up. Yeah, people. thank you. Um, Jeff? Couple of things. I, uh, I, I agree with all of the points about the effectiveness of energy efficiency and renewables. Um, uh, okay. When we talk about what Russia is doing in Ukraine, however, we have to be very, very careful. I have never seen a propaganda campaign as bad as the Western mainstream media propaganda against the Russians between February 24th of this year and today. It's still going on. Everything the Ukrainian government says is a lie and everything okay. the u.s media says about this conflict is a lie that's all i have to say okay thank you um uh, we'll, we'll move on to tonka yes um i want to propose that we spend a grief session on the elephant in the room which is the military budget um when we're all working for the president and the governor here in california to declare a state of climate emergency federally what that means is that the the sacred cow of the military budget no longer is the sacred cow. You can start going to military spending to start solving some of these problems. Uh, the issue of the nuclear power, as has been said, nuclear power is there to develop fissile material for weapons. I think if you take the $2 trillion of what they call the upgrade of our nuclear arsenal. It's not an upgrade. It's a brand new technology. It's a brand new war. Uh, you know, uh, AI and everything. It's a whole new order of magnitude. They need fissile material for that. Um, so just pair up nuclear power with nuclear weaponry. Um, okay. And it's not an upgrade. It's a, we have to start talking about even go beyond left right rhetoric we are talking about a death economy versus a life economy a death culture versus a life culture so harvey i would love to have a uh, a segment dedicated to the nuclear issue in the context of the military budget or vice versa okay very good thank you very much uh, bob badcock george pavernik uh, justin jed had his hand up when he got he Who? quit uh, jed Bulker. Okay, well, Bob hasn't spoken yet, or George, and then we'll go to Jed and Justin. Go ahead, Bob. We're almost out of time. Uh, just four more minutes on this, so go ahead, Bob. And yeah, George. real quickly, just a, a little uh, step back in history. We'll step into the way back machine, if you will. Um, people remember Van Jones. Back a couple of decades ago, Van talked about the Apollo Alliance which basically capitalized on JFK's uh, saying that, you know, we're gonna put a man on the moon in less than a decade. 
He said that I think it was 1960. We did in eight years with technology that did not exist at the time by and large. We can apply that same effort towards sustainable energy and lowering the carbon footprint. We've got the technology. We've got the with ground source heat pumps and this new bill uh, is now getting a 30% 30, 30 tax credit both for residential and commercial. Um, so we can do this. Uh, we just have to put our minds to it. But remember, remember the Apollo Alliance. That's all I've got to say about that. Very good, very good point. Thank you very much. George Pavarnik. George. Uh, and um, we'll go with, uh, go ahead, George. Um, when doing geocat research, I had uh, neutral activation analysis, and that requires a nuclear reactor. Um, a, a research. Oh, George, you're breaking up on us. If you can make it possible. Sherry and uh, Jordan to use things because they're everywhere at uh, just university. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Justin, then we'll finish with Hello. Dorothy. Break. We'll be out of time. Justin LeBlanc, go ahead, and then Dorothy. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Justin. So things to bring up here as a potential the, so national security that distributed grids are more reliable, safer than non-distributed grids and centralized plants, as we're just seeing with this Ukraine nuclear plant issue. And the question is how we get them to actually agree to that because uh, the military contractors love consolidating their power. Well, we have to do something similar to what happened in Washington state back in the 1980s. They tried to jump from uh, the uh, hydroelectric dams straight into nuclear and found out it, it was a fiasco and way too expensive and almost bankrupted the state. So they, they built a coalition of ecotourists and many others from other states to actually push back against these centralized forces and create regional grids that were way, way more efficient. And if we're talking about climate change, we want efficiency because we don't want waste heat. Very good. Okay, Jeffrey Bartow, 30 seconds. Then Dorothy, then we're gonna give Paul uh, Gunter the last word and then we're gonna have to go. Thank you, everybody. Go ahead, Jeffrey, really, for 30 seconds, please. Remember what you said about the remember what you said about the Russians taking over that thing and using it as a shield, the nuclear yes. plant and use well, I'm just well, I just well after hearing that, I just started making a petition to actually make make those places like that a demilitarized zone. Meaning if they, if it goes into effect, Russia will be forced to leave that place. Well, let's hope. Absolutely. Thank if you. If you, that, if you want to help, oh one more thing. Real quick. I did can you share this can you share this recording with the with the with us first. Yes, I will. I and, will. And Thank if you, you want to, and if you want to help me with the petition, you're more than like you're more than okay. welcome to. Thank you, Jeffrey. Much appreciated. Dorothy Reich, and then we'll finish with Paul Gunter. Uh, this has been an, a, an amazing session. Thank you, Steve Caruso, for sticking with us. Dorothy Reich, and then Paul Gunter. Dorothy, uh, she may have left us. Uh, 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 Paul Gunter, uh, you want to wrap us up before we go out? Well, just to uh, sum it up, I think that you know we're now on the cusp of um, uh, of an opportunity to uh, uh, bring more renewables at uh, that are you know the maximum carbon reduction at the least cost and reliably deployable. Uh, deployable. So we just, we need to, um, uh, the problem is that nuclear power is probably going to be, uh, you know, one of the greatest diversions from effective climate crisis mitigation. And, and that's, that's the dilemma, is that we've, we've got to get nuclear out of the way of, you know, it, it, will, it will retard climate crisis mitigation. That's the concern. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Mike Hurst. Uh, next week, we'll be back again, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, this has been an incredible conversation. And I just got to pray now that nothing happens at Zaporizhia. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine. Uh, if you had written a book saying someone would use a nuclear power site with six reactors and basically hold it hostage 
to artillery attacks. I mean, that is beyond satanic. Let's keep hope, keep the faith. And next week we can hopefully talk about how this conflict was resolved.